Hi there YouTube, this is uh, Christ follower Jonathan Chalar once again and I'm answering the question who or what is God? Um, Aristotle argues in book 8 of the physics and book 12 of metaphysics that quote there must be an immortal unchanging being ultimately responsible for all wholeness and orderliness in the sensible world and we are able to discover a great deal about that being. The bare existence of change requires this postulation of a first cause, an unmoved mover whose necessary existence underpins the ceaseless activity of this world of motion. This necessary first cause, unmoved mover, made of pure existence, um, this we call God. God is an independent, divine, eternal, unchanging substance or being. Parmenides said it this way, nothing comes from nothing. However, if the cosmos that we live in had a beginning, it would require an efficient first cause. The cosmological argument would look something like this. Every finite and contingent being has a cause. A causal loop cannot exist. A causal chain cannot be of infinite length. Therefore, a first cause or something that is not an effect must exist. You could also say that same argument this way for the cosmology. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe had a cause. Any scientist out there who believes in the Big Bang will tell you that uh, the universe began to exist. So if the universe began to exist, it must have had a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe had a cause. Very simple. Um, then you have your argument from contingency, which goes something like this. There must be something to explain why the universe exists as we know it today, right? Since the universe could, under different circumstances, conceivably not exist. This is the contingency. That the fact that our universe could not exist, yet it does. So our universe's existence must have a cause. Not merely another contingent thing, but something entirely different. Something that exists by necessity having a necessary existence. In other words, something that must exist in order for anything else to exist. You can also say that the same thing this way. In other words, even if the universe has always existed, let's say our universe always existed, okay? It still owes its existence to an uncaused cause. And this we understand to be God. Aquinas observed that in nature there were things with contingent existences. Since it is possible for such things to exist that are contingent or dependent, there must be some time at which these things did not, in fact, exist. There must have been, in other words, a time 
in in history when nothing existed this is an interesting idea because if this is so there would exist nothing that could bring anything into existence contingent beings therefore are insufficient to account for the existence of other contingent beings um, there must exist a necessary being whose non-existence is an impossibility because of all these contingent beings that depend upon this necessary being and from which the existence of all contingent beings is derived. Gottfried Leibniz said it this way, why is there something rather than nothing? The sufficient reason is found in a substance which is a necessary being bearing the reason for its existence within itself. Hmm. All right, and then you have the argument from degree. Which, the argument from degree goes as follows. There are different degrees that are found in all things. Now, going from that statement, there is found a greater and less degree of goodness, truth, nobility, and the like found in our world. But more or less are just terms spoken of various things as they approach in diverse ways towards something that is the greatest. Just as in the case of hotter, more hot, and hottest. It approaches near and near the greatest heat. Therefore, there exists something that is the truest, best, and most noble, and in consequence, the greatest being. For what are the greatest truths are the greatest beings. What moreover is the greatest in its way in any other way is the cause of all things of its own kind or its own genus so for fire example which is the greatest heat is the cause of all heat therefore there exists something that is the cause of the existence of all things as we know it and also of the goodness and of every perfection whatsoever the argument from degree can be described as this way objects have properties to greater or lesser extents that being said if an object has a property to a lesser extent then there exists some other object that has the property to the maximum possible degree so there is an entity that has all properties to the maximum possible degree and this we call God moving on to the ontological argument our understanding of God is a being than which no greater can be conceived. The idea of God exists in the mind. A being which exists both in the mind and reality is greater than a being that exists only in the mind. If God only exists in the mind, we can conceive of a greater being that which exists in reality we cannot be imagining something that is greater than God therefore God 
exists. And then probably one of the more popular arguments is the teleological argument, also known as the argument from design. And that says that there is this biological complexity in the world that we live in. In other words, it is apparent in our world that there is design and purpose in our own universe. Purpose and design appear to exist in nature beyond the scope of any such human activities. Our universe has sun, moon, stars, earth, mountains, rivers, trees, plants, animals, and even human beings. Given this premise, the existence of a designer can be assumed. The order we see all around us in the world suggests the existence of this designer. Human beings are kind of like cars, so to speak. We have built-in windshields, <laughs> our eyes. We have fluid, our tears. Uh, we have windshield wipers, see? windshield wipers, our, our eyelids, our, our eyelashes. In, in the same way, a car's complexity implies the existence of its maker. So too, one may infer the maker of the universe exists. Um, given the evident complexity of nature, of course. Now let's say you found a car in a field. And if someone should ask how the car happened to be in that place, I should hardly think that for anything you know, that you would say it's more logical that the car might have always been there. Well, if that were so, why couldn't that answer serve for the car as well for a stone that happened to be lying in the field as well? For this reason and for no other, if the different parts of the car had been differently shaped from what they are, or if they were a different size from what they are, or if they were placed in any other order than in the way that they are placed, either no motion would happen to the car, or nothing that could um, carry out momentum in the machine or none which could answer the use that is now served by the car today. In other words, it wouldn't be drivable. Um, just like it would be preposterous to say that the car had no maker um, in light of design and order, it would be preposterous to say that we have no maker. You see? Now, Fred Hoyle said it this way. Would you not say to yourself, some super calculating intellect must have designed the properties of the carbon atom? Otherwise, the chance of my finding such an atom through the blind forces of nature would be utterly minuscule. Of course you would. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics as well as with chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. This designer or maker of all nature we call God. Which brings me to the Christological argument. Now, do you agree that Jesus was a great moral teacher? Do you agree that Jesus was a great moral teacher? If you say no, you are um, 
just a hater. You're just someone that is um, negative toward the possibility of knowledge. Just because um, you hear the name Jesus, you you know are offended at that name, and um, you're not open to any knowledge from this great teacher in history. Now, if you said yes, you agree that Jesus was a great moral teacher. A lot of people, you know, say, yeah, sure, he was a great moral teacher. Um, now, from that, um, I draw the Christological argument. Jesus claimed to be God. This is claimed in John 8, John 10, John 12, John 13, John 14, John chapter 6, John chapter 8. Uh, John chapter 5, Matthew 9, um, Mark chapter 9, 30, verse 31, John chapter 3, um, in, in several uh, places throughout the scriptures. Um, just to name a few, Jesus claimed to be God. He said, I and the Father are one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, when the Pharisees asked him, tell us the truth. Are you the Son of the Most High God? And Jesus said, I am. And there's many other examples. Um... So, Jesus claimed to be God. With that claim, either... So, so Jesus was a wise moral teacher. Now, by the trilemma, Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or he was Lord. Liar, lunatic, or Lord. That's the only options we have. Jesus claimed to be God. He doesn't give us any other room for any other conclusion. Either he was liar, lunatic, or Lord. Now, no wise moral teacher is a dishonest liar. You said earlier that Jesus was a wise moral teacher. If that's so, he cannot be a liar. Now, if you said earlier that Jesus was a wise moral teacher, no wise moral teacher is a deluded lunatic. So we can rule that out as well. Now, since Jesus was a wise moral teacher, and no wise moral teacher is a dishonest liar, then Jesus was not dishonest. Since Jesus was a wise moral teacher, and no wise moral teacher is a deluded lunatic, then Jesus was not deluded. We don't see any other signs of Jesus being a liar or a lunatic in the rest of his testimony we don't see any signs of this in his life other than supposedly in the claims of when he claimed to be God or equal with God um, and since Jesus must have been either a liar lunatic or Lord and Jesus was a wise moral teacher and and no wise moral teacher is a dishonest liar then Jesus was not dishonest, and since Jesus was a wise moral teacher, and no wise moral teacher is a deluded lunatic, then Jesus couldn't have been deluded. Therefore, Jesus must have been God. So by Jesus, we can safely say that God exists. In fact, through the life of Jesus, we clearly see the Logos, John 1.1, 1, 1, that, that Jesus was God made flesh. He could be observed. He could be tested. In fact, he was tested his whole life. Um, in a sense, Jesus is the great science experiments of all creation. So, in conclusion... A.W. Tozer wrote this question now that we've been answering all along. What is God? 
who or what is God? If by that question we mean what is God like in himself, there is no one clear answer. Because we don't want to do idolatry here. But if we mean what has God disclosed about himself, that the reverent reason can comprehend, there is, I believe, an answer both full and satisfying. Now, A.W. Tozer is right here that we cannot know what God is with respect to himself. The book of Job declares this, can you discover the depths of God? Can you discover the limits of the Almighty? They are as high as the heavens. What can you do? Deeper than hell, what can you know? This comes from Job 11, verse 7 through 8. However, we can do this. We can ask God, I mean, we can ask what God has revealed about himself in his word, the Bible, and in creation, the world all around us. And this is what the reverent reason can grasp. Now, when Moses was directed by God to go to the Egyptian Pharaoh and demand, let my people go, <laughs> Moses asked God, before he did that, he said, he, he said, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they might say to me, What is his name? At that point, what shall I say to them? This is written in Exodus 3.13. Now the answer God gave to Moses was simple yet very revealing. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, this is what you shall say to the sons of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Exodus 3.14 the Hebrew text in verse 14 literally says, I be that I be, or I am who I am, I am what I am. This name, I am, speaks to the fact that God is pure existence. When we think of is or exist, that whole thought comes from God himself because God is pure existence nothing would be which is if it wasn't for the necessary being the first cause the unmoved mover as we talked about before so God is this pure existence or what some call pure actuality pure actuality is that which is with no possibility to not exist. Put that another way, many things have existence. Us human beings have existence. Animals, plants have existence. But only one thing can be existence. So you have having existence and being existence itself. Other things have being, but only God is being. The fact that God alone is being leads us to at least five truths about what God is, what type of being God is. First, God alone is self-existent. He's a self-existent being. He's the first cause of everything else that exists. This was spoken about in John 5.26, which simply says, The Father has life in himself. Paul preached that he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. This was spoken about by Paul in Acts 17.25. Secondly, God is a necessary being. 
a necessary being is one whose non-existence is impossible. So, if it's impossible for God to not exist, then only God is a necessary being. All other things are just contingent beings, meaning they could not exist without God. However, let's, let's look at it this way. If God did not exist, then neither would anything else. He alone is the necessary being by which everything else currently exists. A fact that Job states when he said, if he should determine to do so, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish and man would return to the dust. Job 34, verse 14 through 15. Wonderful. So, necessary being, necessary existence. Third point about God. Third characteristic of God is God is a personal being. The word personal in this context does not describe personality. I'm not talking about funny, outgoing, or anything like that. Rather, the word personal means having intent. God is a purposeful being who has a will, creates and directs events to suit him. The prophet Isaiah wrote this way, the Lord says, I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10 fourth thing we can know about God God is a triune being triune means three in one nature we also call this the Trinity to be sure this truth is a mystery yet the whole of Scripture and life in general speaks to this fact the Bible clearly articulates that there is but one God. In Deuteronomy 6 4, when it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But the Bible also declares that there is a three persons to this God. Before Jesus ascended to heaven, he commanded his disciples, Go therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said this in Matthew 28, verse 19. Now notice the singular name it says in the verse. Notice the verse does not say names, which would convey three gods. He didn't say baptizing them in the names of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He said, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So there's not three gods, but there's three persons of the same Godhead, which are all one. And this is a mystery. There is one name belonging to the three persons who make up the Godhead. Scripture in various places clearly calls the Father God, Jesus God, and the Holy Spirit God. All three of these are different representations of the same God. For example, the fact that Jesus possesses self-existence and is the first cause of everything is stated 
in the first verses of John in this way all things came into being through him and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being in him was life that's from John 1 verse 3 through 4 the Bible also says that Jesus is a necessary being he is before all things and in him all things hold together Colossians 1.17, we see that there's this unseen force on every atom, every cell, holding everything together. The Bible declares that Jesus Christ is that unseen force. He holds everything together. Colossians 1.17. In addition to what the Bible says, Creation speaks to us and speaks to the fact that God is a plurality, a triune being. The quintessential pursuit of philosophy has always been to understand the unity and diversity that exists in life. Students go to a university, for example, to find unity in diversity. That's why it's called a university. So in a university, there's these different schools, but it's all one university. Unity and diversity. This is definitely what God is like in his triune nature. How about the coins of the United States? Coins carry the motto, E Pluribus Unum. And that means in Latin, out of the many, one. Out of the many, one. So, trust in God, just like it says on the money. Only in Christianity is a satisfactory answer given for the unity and diversity found in life as we know it. The existence of unity and diversity presupposes unity in diversity in the first cause. And that combination is only found in the triune God of the Bible. Fifth characteristic of God is that God is a loving being. In the same way that many things can exist, but only one thing can be existence, people and other living things can possess and experience love, real genuine love. But only one thing can be love. 1 John 4.8 makes the simple ontological statement. 1 John 4.8 says it this way, God is love. That's the greatest mathematical equation in the universe is that God equals love. What is God? God is the only one who can say, I am who I am. I am that I am. God is pure existence within himself, self-existent, and the source of everything else that possesses existence. He is the only necessary being. God is purposeful. God is personal. And God possesses both unity and diversity. And God is love. And that God is love Right now, he invites you to seek him and find him. You can use reason and logic to discover him. Discover the love that he has for you in his word, the Bible, and through his life, through the life of, of his son, Jesus Christ, sent from the Father. Jesus is the one who died for your sins and made a way for you to live with him for eternity. If anyone 
really wants to know who and what God is, it can be tested. Just like in a science experiment, you have a hypothesis and and you do test results and that the, at the end you have a conclusion the only way we can get to the conclusion that God exists is because if God does exist then he's knowable if God is knowable then it has nothing to do with religion but with a relationship the God of the Bible wants to make a relationship with you right now through his son Jesus Christ and if you sincerely in your heart say God you win I see now that you are Lord and that you are necessary existence and all the evidence points to you and if you humble yourself cry out to him to save you turn from sin and turn to God through Jesus Christ as your only payment for sin ask him to be your Savior and Lord right now he will save you that's a firm promise from Romans 10 9 and 10 that if you believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sins and that the Father rose him from the dead on the third day and if you confess that with your mouth that Jesus is Lord you will be saved that's a firm promise from God's Word now when you're you're ready to repent you could pray something like this dear God you win I don't I don't want to be God I don't want to try to be smarter than everybody else you know you are wisdom and uh, I realize now that you must exist God if you're real please reveal yourself to me come into my heart it says in your word the Bible that I'm a sinner so God because of my sin I deserve death on the cross but I thank you Jesus that you took my place on the cross died for my sins and on the third day you rose again I thank you Jesus that you took away my sin now God come into my life be my Savior and Lord show me the evidence that you are God I thank you for saving a sinner like me. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Now, when you're ready, if you pray that prayer, God will save you. Not because the words are anything special, but because your prayer of faith in Jesus is what saves you. So if you just pray that prayer, believing in Jesus, you just got born again <laughs> Amen. the Lord saved you out of all your troubles and he has given you a new mind and a new heart that can understand the things of God and you have come alive as a child of God and I want to hear from you please leave a comment um, below in this section or you can message me personally and I will, I will pray for you and just encourage you. I want to encourage you right now. Get in God's word that we were talking about in this video. Find out the scriptures we talked about in the book of John. That's a good starting place. And find a Bible-based church. And, uh, and God has a wonderful plan for your life. A great destiny. Thank you for listening and watching. And I'll be uh, talking to you again soon. God bless you.